And good evening. It's good to have you guys here at Cornerstone for our services tonight. Let's go ahead and get the services started. As we come on in, Stan, we're going to look at our hymnals tonight. We're going to actually sing number 74, Majesty Worship His Majesty. Great song as we focus on the Lord tonight. Number 74, take your hymnals, and we're going to sing Majesty tonight. Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flows from His throne. singing. Please remain standing as we continue with prayer at this time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening that we might gather to hear your holy word. We praise you for all the blessings you shower upon us. And Father, we ask that if there's anyone here tonight that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they would choose to accept him before it's everlasting too late. Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross for us, that we might have salvation. In his holy name, amen. Amen. We're going to continue with another song, so take your hymnals. Number 404, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Great song here, 404, The Solid Rock, as we sing all four verses tonight. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest grain, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails, his loving face, I rest on his unchanging grace. High and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant is to forth me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and say on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound oh then I may in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand amen great singing and you guys may be seated Man and good evening. Good to see you tonight. Trust that the Lord will bless you as we look at His Word in just a little while. Uh, this month, we January, uh, we emphasize stewardship, uh, striving together for the faith of the gospel and our stewardship of our time, talent, and tithe. Uh, February, we're going to be looking and focusing on the various youth ministries uh, that we have in the church and. We'll begin next Sunday by having James uh, come and speak to us uh, as he candidates for the position of youth pastor here at the church. So uh, 
just mark that on your calendar. Just be aware that that is going to take place. Uh, other than that, I think we've made all the announcements two or three times, so I think uh, you have them. Other than uh, the couple's retreat, you need to get signed up if you haven't, and uh, deposits are due today uh, for that. If you need to make other arrangements, uh, let us know. We'll work with you uh, to, to help you with that. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and receive our tithes and offerings, gifts to the Lord. We're moving very quick. You might even get out early tonight. I wouldn't count on it, but you might. All right. Uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer then. Brother Hurd's going to come lead us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for this time that we can be in your house this evening and that we pray that uh, you bring your, bless the offering uh, that you're going to uh, bring forth tonight and that you'll just touch our hearts with uh, your word. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for that, Kathy. Let's go ahead and stand as we continue our services. We're going to look at another song tonight, 588. We have come into his house to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. That's what we are here for today. Uh, let's go ahead as we look at 588. We'll do both verses tonight. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship worship him we have come into his house gathered in his name to worship him we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship christ the lord worship him christ forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him let's forget about ourselves and gather in his name and worship him let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship christ the Worship Him, Christ the Lord. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. Right now the choir is going to come and sing for us uh, the song entitled, The Love of God.
let's go ahead and stand as the choir goes down. We're going to have a handshake hymn, number 81. What a wonderful Savior is He. That is our Christ. Uh, number 81, as we stand, take your hymnals. We'll do the first and the last tonight. But what a wonderful Savior tonight. Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed. The price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior. My Lord, as the choir and orchestra go down at this time, you can go ahead and turn around and shake a couple hands. my Jesus what a wonderful all right as we're getting back in our places tonight let's go ahead and sing that last verse lift it up with me number 81 what a wonderful Savior he gives me overcoming power what a wonderful Savior and triumph in each trying hour what a wonderful Savior what a wonderful Jesus, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Wonderful singing. You may be seated at this time. All right. Well, we'll do just a couple testimonies if you want to uh, share with us how God has blessed you and encouraged your life. Uh, we're going to give you a chance to do that in just one second. I forgot to mention, though. Uh, Brother McLamara is going home probably tomorrow. He had a, a couple skips and heartbeat early this morning, and uh, they want to watch him for another day. So just keep him on your prayer list if you would. But he's doing fine walking, and, and memory's getting better, and all the things that you expect to see. So we're excited about that. All right, anyone have a testimony? Your turn. All right, Jim Clark. Man, I was going to recognize them tonight since Janet's not here in the morning usually, and she's not here tonight. So, uh, ha happy anniversary anyway. All right, to anyone else? Mrs. Steele. Amen. Anyone else? Your opportunity. All right. Then I'll speak. Let's let the girl sing first. my voice was never raised in joyful singing I could only cry in sadness and despair all the guilt 
thoughts and pain my sinfulness was bringing made me realize i was trapped in satan's snare though i tried i was unable to escape it how i needed someone who could rescue me jesus stretched his hand i only had to take it by his bloody justified and set me free he brought me out of the miry clay where i was sinking he lifted me from the pit i laid in for so long he set my feet upon the rock of my salvation and in my mouth he placed a brand new song now i lift my voice and sing about salvation about my great redemption through his blood i am singing for i am a new creation and i want the world to know what christ has done so i sing about the joy that he has given about his boundless mercy love and grace and i sing about the home i so long he set my feet upon the rock of my salvation and in my mouth he placed a brand new song he set my feet upon the rock of my salvation and in my mouth he placed a brand new song a brand new song Thank you, ladies. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Philippians, chapter number three. Philippians, chapter number three. And as you find that, please stand in honor of God's word. We'll get, begin reading with verse seven and read through verse 16. If you would, I'll read the uh, odd verses, you read the even. But what things were counted, uh, things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. If by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if in anything uh, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Let us look to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word and for uh, the example of the Apostle Paul, uh, the words that challenge us 
uh, that were given to him by the Holy Spirit so that uh, we might be strengthened, we might be aware of what we can do and what we should be as your children. We ask your blessing upon the message tonight and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want to emphasize or uh, mainly talk about verse 13 and verse 14, two very familiar verses to most Christians. I think basically uh, what Paul is saying is we're either going forward, standing still, or falling behind. Paul said in his case, he wanted to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. But in doing so, he's urging us to do the same thing. If we're either going forward, standing still, or falling behind, the same is true for churches. The problem is that it's so easy to become complacent and comfortable. And these beginning these are the prelude to just standing still. Once we stand still, everyone passes us by and we begin to fall behind as God would have us. Paul believed that we ought to move ahead. Paul said he wanted to move ahead. It is God's desire for us to be continually uh, pressing toward the mark, moving forward, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward unto those things which are before. Paul believed that's the way it should be. And it's the only way to avoid stagnation as a church. As a church, then, we need to think, what does it mean to move ahead? What does it mean to move forward? Well, one thing is for sure, we should never be satisfied with the past or believe that what we're doing in the present is all that we can or should do. Too many times we come to the place in our Christian lives and we come to the place in churches where we want to look back at what used to be. Now there were some good things in the past. I rejoice the things that God has done. But if we only live for what we used to be, what God used to do, we're going to miss what God can do. And we're going to miss the blessings of being where he wants us to be. So we need to look at things differently. Never satisfied. Always pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. To achieve that, God will give us the opportunity but we must be ready to move forward when he does. We must meet the challenge of the future. And there are certain challenges we need to accept. Now, I don't intend to list a lot of specific things to do. That would take a long time. But I do intend to list many of the different kind of things we can do. We just need to decide. As individual Christians, we need to make a point, if I could say it that way, that the challenges before us are there because God wants us to do something about them. So the first thing I would tell you is where to make a difference in the world. We need to accept the challenge of making a difference in this world. Now, there are all kinds of verses uh, that we could focus on. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 for just a second. I'll give you just a couple. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if, you, if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So let your light 
shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, Peter says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That means that we have some special work to do. Jesus made it clear that we're to have an effect on the world around us. So we need to uh, uh, accept the challenge of making a difference in our world. That difference will come as we are rooted and grounded and founded upon the Word of God. But the Word of God today seems to be foreign to many people. It doesn't seem to have the importance that it once did. We tend to overlook reading it, studying it, memorizing it. Therefore, we just don't always know what it says. We're not always ready to move forward as the Word of God directs us. And then we need to understand that in our society, we've allowed certain things to happen. Christians have been silenced and made to feel unwelcome and unwanted by the world. Today, to be able to get along, we just kind of keep our mouth shut. We think that's a little easier than being a light or being salt. But we can't afford to let the world shut us up. I used to say it this way, they may think we're nuts, but the truth is, they're the one that's nuts. We know where heaven is. We know how to get there. And we know where they're going. Since we are not screwed onto the right bolt, if you want to say it that way, we should never let the world silence us with the message of the gospel. But we've been silenced. We hear it on radio and news. If there's a uh, issue that's biblical and we take a stand, we're fanatics. That's okay. I got some news for you, though. It's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any easier. The world is never going to love us. They didn't love Jesus. They crucified him. They didn't love his disciples, the apostles. They uh, uh, killed all of them except one. The reality is the church has always had a difficult time through history. We just have a lot more ways to spread that news. But the fact is, we cannot let them shut us up or shut us out or shut us in. We need to spread the world, the message, just by our lives. We need to make a difference in this world. People need to see that there is a difference. We read the scripture a while ago about the salt. Uh, I, I know a couple things about salt. I know too much of it in the wrong place doesn't taste good. I know too little of it doesn't do any good, makes it bland. But here's something that you can learn. We are the salt of the earth. Didn't Jesus say that? Do any of you have salt shakers at home? I suspect most of you do. As long as the salt's in the shaker, does it do any good? Does it season anything? Does it preserve anything? It does nothing. If you dump all the salt on one piece of meat, is that meat going to be good? No. You see, in order for salt to be effective, it must be spread and sprinkled around. As long as the church thinks this is it, we go to church, and all the salt is concentrated in a building, and it's not going out into the world, we'll not season the world. 
Matter of fact, usually when the salt stays in one place too long, it gets lumpy. It doesn't work at all. We can't afford to be shut up by the world. We must go out and reach the lost. Now, we must not resort to ungodly actions, but we must continue to show the world that we have answers to the problems that are plaguing mankind. Here's an example of that. I believe every Christian ought to oppose abortion. I think it's murder. But we do not need to keep our mouths quiet because it's politically unacceptable. But we need to speak out because it's morally wrong. But on the same boat, those uh, who decide that they're going to kill others are just as wrong. We need to take proper stands and live like we believe the gospel, live like, live like we believe the scripture, that we can make a difference. We can change the world the same way God's people have always changed the world. Let me repeat it because I'm going to tell you how, they, how they've done it. We can change the world the same way that God's people have always changed the world. What is that way? One person at a time. It's really how it's worked. You go back, back in history, it's been people going out and uh, as salt and light into the world and changing the world that they live in. But it only happens when this person gets right with God and this person gets right with God and they affect somebody else and we spread it one person at a time. We do that by teaching. We do that by preaching the gospel and changing the hearts and the minds of those who live around us. We need to accept the challenge of reaching our world with the gospel. I have run into people, you do, that think this world is no longer open to the gospel. But I want to tell you the reason that's there. It's based upon a failure of a well-planned effort to evangelize the local community. But in fact, that is really not the reason. It's because there's, is it because there's so much opposition or animosity to the church that no one will listen? The answer to that one's no. Is it because the people so hated God that they refused to yield to his will? And the answer is no. It's usually just because the local church simply does not make the effort. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 15, most of you can quote it. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Coca-Cola is well known. So well known that you can go to some of the most remote places in the world and there you'll find bottles of Coke. Now some of you were on this mission trip. I know Joy and David were. Uh, when we went to uh, Mexico, they told us, those of us who uh, did this part of the trip, part of them stayed up on the mountain and the rest of us went down I don't know, 3,000 feet down the mountainside, something like that, into a village. They said a uh, white man had never been there. When we got there, guess what? They had Coke. Actually, there was a 
Pentecostal church down there that I was glad to sleep in a Pentecostal church because it had rained and it was muddy, and I was thankful for that. But my point is very simple. Coca-Cola's found a way to get into the world. Their model used to be think globally, but act global, uh, locally. That should be a model of every church. Think globally. Send missionaries, but act locally. Do what we can here while we're sending them abroad uh, to be saved. Coke wants to be everywhere. But to do it, they know that they have to take care of each location. I think there's a lesson to be learned from them. It's tremendous that we're able to have the mission program that we have. We'll be looking at over $140,000 in our missions budget for this year, maybe. I haven't met with the deacons yet. But I've got a structure bud budget made out that two of our fine teenagers helped me make. Right? Okay. They're shaking their head. They don't know what to do. We have a couple interns in our school that are doing some things. So one of the things I gave them was, here's the missions. Now you figure out a budget. I didn't even help them. I just gave them some ideas. And uh, then I showed them why I did what I did. But my point is this. We're sending missionaries all around the world. There's no time probably that the gospel is not being preached somewhere as a result of this church. And I think that's tremendous. But if we fail to reach the people in our own community, then it will hinder the work. You see, the only way we can send missionaries to other parts of the world is to reach people for Christ and give them the same burden as the missionary. But if we fail to reach people, it will eventually hinder the mission work. Then we need to, to accept the challenge of developing leadership. Have you thought about who will lead the church, this church, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul invested himself in the training of Timothy. And Timothy was to do the same thing with those that he would come in contact with. He would in turn invest his life in, in, in others. We as Christians must develop our future leaders. There's a responsibility of leaders to train. There's a responsibility of followers to be trained. But I ask you again, 20 years from now, who will our leaders be? We'll determine that. I thought back when I come up with this thought in, in the message. And I can tell you, I'm going to miss some. So don't be offended. I, I hate almost to call names because I always leave somebody out. And it is not my intention to do so. But I, I'm looking at the leaders of our church today who were come up as young people in our youth groups or who got saved in, in this church and they developed into the Christian that they should be. And I think of the positions that they hold. David King was one of our rascals. A deacon now. Mark Weaver, trustee. Pat Scheidler. Mike Williams, trustee. 
Terry Plew and Tina Scheidler in the school, Robert Salazar and Amy Reidenauer, likewise. Brent Reidenauer grew up in our church, Barbara Harris, Megan Lyons, Joni Pointer, Jay Stevens, Amber Sherrill, Nathaniel Salazar, Donnie Harp, and you fill in the rest of the blanks. But my point is, what about tomorrow? It's good that we're here today, but what about tomorrow's leaders? Are we developing them? To lead, first of all, we have to have someone to follow, but we have to have the desire to lead first. You see, good leaders most often first learn how to be a good follower. The need today is for men to be leaders, but too often men, and this I'm thankful in this church it's not quite that way, but too often men have uh, allowed the leadership roles to be taken by their wives. You see, God has a chain of authority, and we must respect and develop uh, along that chain if we're going to succeed in accomplishing his will. I'm thankful for the ladies that we have that serve the Lord. I don't mean that. We don't. But uh, they're not pastors, and they're not deacons. God gave a chain of authority in the home. The husband is to bring the wife along, and, and as a husband, we have a responsibility to develop them. Our children need to see what a home should be like as they examine uh, the lives of our leaders. Then we need to accept the challenge of following God's word. The effort to move the church forward into the future must not and cannot afford to abandon the foundation of the scripture as being the authority for what we do. In recent years, there's been decisions by some churches that threaten to change, to change our worship and our work with some unbiblical reasoning and thinking. Some of those are the increased use of entertainment as a replacement for worship. And you can find those today. Someone asked me recently, because people come and go, and most of you have been around, why don't we clap when they get done singing like the ladies' group? Because you clap for entertainers. You say amen to those who are serving God and bringing glory to his name. We don't have entertainers. I don't want entertainers. I want people whose heart is in serving God. And that is the reason that they serve, not to be recognized by men. There's been a change in a lot of churches and abandoning the model of male leadership. You can go around this city now and find many women pastors, but you don't find that in the scripture. You find other instructions there. We find a de-emphasis on the importance of repentance and forgiveness for salvation. Let's get along. Let's not tell people they're sinners, that they're lost, that they need to repent. That's the th thinking. But I'll tell you, it's amazing that God says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It seems to be important to God. It ought to be to the church. Then there's compromise in various other doctrinal points for the sake of making Christianity more appealing to the world. Here's what the Bible says about the importance of God's word. Deuteronomy 12, 32. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. 
Thou shalt not add thereunto, nor diminish from it. Revelation 22, 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Revelation 22 and verse 19. And if any man take away from the words of this, the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. If we believe the Bible is the word of God, we must also believe that God has put it in all that we must do or put in it all that we must do to serve him. And we cannot afford to change it either by version or by neglect. We must be careful. Beyond that, people simply add or subtract their own ideas and desires in place of God's word. Sometimes even saying, I know this is what God says, but I am believing that this is what we should do. Can I say it this way? We need to be rooted in the book. We must know what God's will is. We must not be tied to our traditions, our customs, that we fight not against God's will. We must not be so quick to look for new answers and methods that we neglect what God says. Ultimately, moving the church forward in the future involves every member striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's all of us collectively. No one can do it by themselves. Since church is people, and the church move only as the people move, all these challenges are personal. The personal challenges to each one of us. This is my church. It's composed of people like me. It will be friendly if I am. It will do a great work if I work. It will, be gen it will make generous gifts to many causes if I am generous. It will bring others into its fellowship if I bring them. Its seats will be filled if I fill them. It will be a church of loyalty and love and faith and service if I make that what it is and am filled with these. Therefore, with God's help, I dedicate myself to the task of being all these things that I want my church to be. What kind of church do you want to be part of? One that's growing? One that's moving forward? Then we must take part. We must each do our part. The challenge tonight is, will you accept the challenge to see this church grow and be all that God intends for it to be. But remember this, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. If you're part of the chain, are you holding up your part? Or are you gonna let God down and others down? Let's stand for prayer. We take just a moment to consider as we wrap up kind of stewardship month. Am I doing my part to make this church what God wants it to be? Am I being faithful to the place that I'm to serve? If I, am I being faithful to do those things which God leads me to do? We each must make that choice. Each of us have to say, it's my church. And if we recognize that, we each have a responsibility to that church. Tonight, as God speaks to your heart, here's a place to pray, a time to come to the Lord. We would urge you to do so. Heavenly Father, as we 
Take a moment to search our hearts. Take a moment to consider what you can do, want to do, and desire to do with our lives and with our church. Help each of us as members of this church, and those some are here as guests, help them to see they have a responsibility to your work also. But help us as members to be in the place that you want us to be, serving as you want us to serve, faithful as we can be to your work. And if we strive together for the faith of the gospel, you will bless. Help us to do that. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 370 in your hymn book, I'll Live for Him, as we sing that together. God speaks to your heart. Here's a place to pray, a time to come to the Lord. Won't you let God's will be done in your life? I'll live for him. Won't you come to the Lord? My life, my love, I give to thee, thou Lamb of God who died for me. Oh, may I ever faithful be, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be. I live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. You listen to the words you're singing, I'll live for him who died for me. Will you really live for him? As we sing another verse, won't you come to the Lord? I now believe thou dost receive, for thou hast died that I might live. And now henceforth I'll trust in thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me, how happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. One more verse. Oh, thou who died on Calvary to save my soul and make me free, I'll consecrate my life to thee, my Savior and my God. I'll live for him who died for me, how happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Trust the Lord will bless you, encourage you to be back uh, Wednesday night, be in prayer for next Sunday as uh, James King comes to uh, candidate uh, and as we begin Youth Month. In, in our church as we strive together for the faith of the gospel. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Mr. T, would you dismiss us, please? Father, Lord, we do thank you and praise you for this service that we had, that we are able to take your word to apply it to our lives. We just pray that we will all strive together to uh, lift up your name throughout this community. Lord, I just pray that you will just uh, continue to watch over us at our works, at uh, classes, and everything that we do that will be pleasing to you. We thank you for what you've done and what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen.